So welcome, ladies, to Women Express. I'm very, very happy to be with. I actually opened up my Zoom link saying I'm going to be talking to my friend today, Susan Colbert. And Susan and I have really only known each other. We just met each other at a mutual friend's house at a party here in Washington, D.C. And I had been told by my friend that I had to meet Susan. I had to meet Susan. I had to meet Susan. She kept saying it. And Susan and I just didn't have a chance until Karen just happened to have a graduation party for her daughter. And I sat down at a table with Susan, not knowing that this was Susan. And we had the best conversation, just an easy conversation. It was no big deal. And then at the very end, we realized because of her <laughs> husband that this was the Susan Goldberg that I wanted to meet. So it's just wonderful to have you today. Well, thank you so much for having me on. And it was a it was a wonderful conversation. And I'm so glad that we finally did get to meet. Me too. So I'm going to do all of the wonderful bio stuff first. And then we're just going to have a chat. Because Good. what Women Express is all about is about women's voices. I try my best to get the women that I interview are women who really are forging ahead with the voices of women and voices of stories even of women. So when I heard you talk so much about women's voices and storytelling, I knew you were right up the alley. So I'll do the formal stuff and then I'll go back to informal because that's where you and I have the most fun. So Susan Goldberg was the first female editor of National Geographic's since it was first published in October 19, oh, I'm sorry, 1888. That's a long time. And finally, she brought it home and brought it into the world of women leading a, a national organization. I have to say, I have to get a little bit, little bit off script here and go, I can't remember a day. We had a wall in our basement where there was nothing but National Geographic's. And it actually, the, the original warehouse was down the street from where I went to high school. I've heard Washington, that story so many times of people who oh. have that wall of yellow spines. Sometimes it's in their attic, sometimes it's in their basement, sometimes it's in their living room. But I, being the editor of National Geographic, you hear that story all the time. All the time. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful way of, and you go into those books, I guess I am really off script. You go into those books and you, all of a sudden, your small community becomes part of a really large community of experiences and knowledge and wisdom and things that you just never seen before and probably would never have experienced if it wasn't for National Geographic. And I have to tell you, you probably don't know this. I, as soon as Karen told me about you, I immediately bought the women, the National Geographic image collection. Oh, I actually have two <laughs> one, and both of them are in my office. I keep meaning to bring one home, but we get so caught up in it in our office that I never get a chance to bring it home. And I have the same experience looking at all the pictures of those women in that book. It's quite incredible. I was really proud that we, I know we're off script, but I really was proud that we published that book just a few years ago. So we, you know, we took, we, we, we use the National Geographic archives, which go back, you know, about 130 years and looked mm -hmm. at how women were pictured over the decades. And it is just an amazing look at snapshots in time that show the power that women have or that they didn't have all over the world. And, you know, just, yes. just up to up to the present day. And it is it's kind of a, a book that takes you on a journey uh, of a, the journey of a collective journey about women. And I am just very, very proud of that book. It's something to be proud of. I mean, really, I look at, you know, just looking at fingernail polish that might have been chipped off or different hairstyles from really formal hairstyles to wild and woolly of all races. It's, it is a journey and it's a wonderful journey into the life of women. It's just, so thank you for creating that because that is truly, in my eyes, is one of your biggest legacies. I really feel that about that. But there are good things, other good things. So she was named and voted one of Washington's 11 most influential women in the media by the Washingtonian Magazine. 
In March 2015, she received the Exceptional Women in Publishing Award for Exceptional Women in Publishing. That makes sense. 2017, and again in 2018, the Washingtonian named you one of the most powerful women in the Washington, D.C. area across profession. I, I met her at the table. We had a great conversation. I didn't, you know, all of this. It's so, that's why I love you so much because there's so much here, but we were just at the table, both being moms talking about our son. And that's the beauty nice. of, of you. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the, you know, the human connection part of sitting down next to somebody you don't know. And all of a sudden you have a bunch in common. That's the beauty yeah. of it. Yeah. It was really beautiful. And then in 2020, I love this in style magazine included her as, in the badass 50 list, <laughs> naming her number seven. Number seven on the badass list is not as badass, I would say. <laughs> How did that feel? Uh, well, I must say I was certainly surprised. Um, it, it, was, it was pretty funny. Uh, you know, these, these lists, I think you really do need to kind of take it all with a grain of salt. But it is really yeah. nice being included on a list of such accomplished women and you find yourself in pretty amazing company and you think, how in the heck did I get on this list? You know, who, they must have had some crazy person making a choice, but honestly, it, 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 it made me smile. Being, being on the badass list actually made me smile. I know. When I saw that, I was like, okay, that's why we get along so well, because I, I would <laughs> consider myself a badass and Maybe someday I'll be on that list as well, but I'm happy that you are. And it's funny because you really do, you are very humble in, in the way that you present yourself and the way that you are. It was your husband that told me, you need to have set up an appointment with her and you need to get her on your podcast and you two need to connect more. <laughs> he's, he's my PR agent, I find, uh, over and over again. He, he is always, he's, he does, he's, an incredibly supportive spouse. Yeah, you can tell that. And that's an important thing when you're doing all the kinds of things that you're doing. You know, you have to have that support system right there saying, okay, keep going. You started out that way though. And you knew I was going to go in this direction. I'm just going to go off script and get back into the nature of who you are. You started out that way because you decided at a very young age when you're in college to just stop doing that and to go to, was it the Seattle Intelligence? And take yeah. a, a position there and just drop out of, drop out of college. I know, it's, it's really kind of crazy looking back on it. Um, but I was, a, I was a summer reporting intern at the Seattle Post Intelligencer. And I was between my junior and my senior years. And at the end of the eight or 10 week internship, the editor came up to me. And he said, so kid, do you want to stay? And I wanted to stay more than anything and become a full-time reporter. But there was a phone call that I had to make first. And I had to call my <laughs> father, who was a university professor. And, and I had to say, you know, Pop, I am dropping out of college and I'm going to stay here in Seattle to be a full-time reporter. And there's this pause. And it gets to be a very, very long pause on the phone. And finally, he said the thing, Denise, that I least expected him to say. He said, good for you, Susan. We're very proud of you. And I was just incredulous. And really, though, I look back on that call as such a gift because it wasn't just his permission that I could stay, but his endorsement of that very unconventional choice that I was going to drop, you know, a university professor whose daughter is dropping out of college to start working full time. Um, and he really endorsed that choice because he knew, I think, how much it meant to me and how happy I was about it. And I really consider that the start of my professional life. Maybe the yeah, start of my, I, yeah. Yeah, it really, I mean, every time I hear that story, I sit in amazement because, again, not so much that he gave you permission, that there's been this level of not only risk-taking that you, you just, if you, when people see this, interview, they will see there's something about the resolute. You're, there's, a, there's something resolute in you that I think people pick up on and they know, okay, she knows where she's going. All right. So I, I, I give her my blessing. Off you go. Have fun. Right. 
Well, you know, I always, when I tell this story to young people all the time, and but I always do hasten to add, I finally did finish college because I don't want anybody just like dropping out and saying, but Susan did it. Um, so I, I did finally finish college, although it took me a while because I ended up taking night school classes while working full time. And I'll tell you, that has given me a lifelong appreciation for people who can work all day long and then go to school at night over a long period of time. It is incredibly, I found it incredibly difficult. I mean, people get their law degrees and business degrees and all kinds of things going to school at night. And gosh, it gave me a real, a real admiration for that. Yeah, it's a tough road. I mean, I know so many people around me who did the exact same thing because they wanted to go into their careers first. And, and what they ended up doing is going back and going to night school. But you also, speaking of college, universities, you're now the dean at the University of Arizona. Tell us about that. Not the University of Arizona. It is the Arizona State University. That's right. So Arizona I, State I, I, University. I, I, yes, my boss is actually the dean. I'm a I'm a vice dean, and I am based here in Washington D.C. Uh, I just joined up here about five months ago after leaving my job at National Geographic. Um, and it's, it's a very exciting role, you know, finally figuring out a way to kind of give back to the next generation of people who want to be journalists. And this was very important to me to do and very meaningful. I'm finding working with young people and trying to figure out, you know, how do we, how do we help our profession in the future? How do we make sure that they have the most preparation for what is it? incredibly changing and complex career, um, mm -hmm. you know, in journalism, in media. And we've seen so many changes in the last 20 years, especially. And I think that the pace of change is only growing. So I'd like to try to help figure that out. Yeah, it, I mean, the last six years has been incredible. And there's so much, so more, there's more ways to have conversations in the media than there was ever before and how you interpret what's out in the media, you know, how, how that comes through. Well, and that is one of the biggest issues is an issue of trust and trust in the media, unfortunately, is at an all time low. So how, well, so while the barriers of entry to media are much lower than they ever were before. So anybody can be telling their story trust in the media at the same time has dropped to, you know, an all time low level. And there is more mis and disinformation out there. I yeah. think all these things are, are rather related, but it is a very important time for us to really figure out how do we regain credibility as an institution with the public? Mm -hmm. Because we've got a really important role to play. You know, fact-based yeah. journalism has an incredibly important role in the functioning of society and the functioning of democracy. So we've got to regain that trust. It's very important. So you're the vice dean and professor of practice at Arizona State University with dual appointments to the Walter Cron Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication and the College of Global Futures. That's a long title. Oh, it's what a ridiculous. It yeah. Oh my gosh. It's a ridiculously long title. <laughs> what it really means is that I have, I, so I'm with the journalism school and I'm with the school where they put a lot of their scientists and environmental specialists. And one of the things that I'm trying to do is bring those two schools together to see if we can fix or make better the way we tell stories about one of the existential issues of our time, which is climate, environment, and sustainability. You know, right now, a lot of times people don't even want to read stories about what's going on in, in the environment. And they sort of run screaming from the room because the stories are pretty depressing. And um, I think they leave people feeling hopeless or overwhelmed. So one of the things I'm trying to do is figure out what is the kind of content that resonates better with audiences and how do we tell those stories, not just by journalists talking to the general public, but also mm -hmm. how do we help scientists talk to journalists in, you know, because they're the real authorities there. They really, you know, they're, they're the subject matter experts, but a lot of scientists, and I don't mean to paint with too broad of a brush, but a lot of scientists really don't do a very good job of translating their own expertise in, in ways that the rest of us can understand and appreciate what they're saying. Yeah. And then we write it off because we don't understand at all. And then some of the most important salient points don't get across. 
Exactly. You and I had a long talk about that because for years in teaching people how to present, how to get their content to the public, most of the time I'm working with people in, in technology and it's the same issue. It's like the wonderful things, these, this innovative stuff that's coming out, but the people who create the innovation can't tell you really that much about what they do in terms that we understand. You know, right. and it's so important. It is. And, and really, it's just, it's not that people can't, it's just that they've never really thought about it. I mean, as it is right now, the incentive system for scientists is not um, toward public communication. The incentive system for scientists, say you're trying to get tenure at a university, is to write a bunch of papers for other scientists about important stuff. It isn't communicating with the public. If you communicate with the public, not only are you not rewarded for that, but um, you know, in some some scientists might kind of look down on you for quote unquote dumbing down your material. So that's just a mindset that really needs to change because the the need for scientists and other technical experts, including technology experts, to be able to communicate has never been greater. That's true. It's very true. You and I did a, a in our conversation at Karen's house. We did talk a lot about storytelling women st telling stories, people telling stories, just the art of storytelling in general. And you have quite a view on that. So would you mind sharing that with everyone? Storytelling is very important. Oh, well, storytelling is, you know, from time immemorial, how we, you know, how we absorb information, whether it's, you know, people sitting around a campfire or people on a high technology means like the one that we're, we're using right now. But you know, it is how information is transmitted and passed down generation to generation. And we are so lucky to be living in a time when there are so many different ways we can tell those stories. You know, when I was coming up as a journalist, I was a, you know, a reporter, a newspaper reporter. So it was just all I ever thought about was the words, words on, on a page, right? Ink on dead trees. <laughs> uh, but, but now, of course... You know, and, and working in a place like National Geographic for eight years, you realize there are so many ways to tell stories. Yes, of course, there's still ink on dead trees, but there's all the ways we tell stories on social media. There are all the ways we tell stories through visual, various visual media, whether that's TikTok or Instagram or amazing right. map or interactive graphics. And I, I think the strength in journalism today is taking various elements and putting them together into a package that can appeal to everybody, whether you're the kind of learner who likes to read your information, or do you really like looking at pictures, or do you really get into a graphic that will help you understand it the best? You know, I think we can open the doors open really wide to just everybody and have larger and more diverse audiences than we ever could when it was just ink on dead trees. Yeah, that's true. It's funny because I, when you're saying this, I remember when USA Today came out and it right. had color and we all were so amazed. Like, oh my goodness, this is in color. So it's right. interesting to see how far. And now I have to be honest, my team has been on me about TikTok. You need to be on TikTok. You need to be on TikTok. And I'm like, why? And then I read the research and I realized, well, it's another form of telling your story. Right. And it will appeal to a different audience that you're not necessarily going to get on this. Um, yeah. You know, a, a younger audience still. And right. after TikTok, there's going to be something else, right? And that is the, the challenge and the beauty of it, which is it is how we tell stories is ever changing. But the the beauty of the story itself, the facts of the story, the humanity of the story, that is what is eternal. And so it's just the, the means change all the time. And I love this thing that you say about the humanity of the story, because one of the things about really being a great communicator is that human side, telling that human side, which stories are bridged from telling that human side to having humans hear what you're saying more clearly, being able to associate with what you're saying, which is why I love the, the, the women's book that you did, because I could associate myself, even though these women were everywhere around the world, I could associate myself through their stories. And that just helps us all glow glo globally, individually, personally. I just, I just think it's a wonderful thing. 
Well, the more you can relate to other people, even though they're people you might never meet and people who might from come from countries or cultures that you don't have any exposure to and may never go to or understand, but the more that you can connect at that human level, the more real those stories are and the more understanding we have of each other. You know, it's like, you know, it's like what I'm talking about with climate change. So you can give somebody a lecture in science about why that's important, or you can talk about the impact that global climate change is having on people all over the world who are literally going to have to flee their homes. And that's going to include people in Miami, Florida, and not terribly long from now, and, and have to move somewhere else because of rising seas or whatever is the impact. If you look at what's going on in the southwest part of the yeah. United States now with the fires and the temperatures, and yeah. you talk about the human impact or the impact on animals or the way that the landscape is changing, those are the ways to touch people's hearts and ultimately their heads. Not, I don't think, for most people through a science lecture. Yeah, it's not going to happen through science because it's not a head thing. People buy through emotion. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they'll justify with facts, but mostly they buy through emotions, how they're stirred emotionally. Well, what do you think this means for women? I mean, storytelling, having a stronger voice. What do you think this means? You've been a pioneer as a woman in so many fronts. Do you see a horizon? Do you see some fronts that are important for us, some ways that we can be more clear about our story and tell our stories. There's a lot going on for women right now. There is, and there always is a lot going on for women. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's really important to always remember how much things have changed, even when, even when, you know, rights might be taken away or a lot of women are not represented in, you know, equal numbers. There's not an even playing field still in many workplaces and many professions. But I, uh, still, all of that said, there's been so much positive change and we should never forget that. And we have to keep encouraging each other and ourselves because we have seen real change in a fairly short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Um, But there is so far to go and in, and, you know, on the, in the political arena and whether you're a a banker or a lawyer or a journalist or a scientist, there shouldn't be a national, shouldn't have to be a national news story. Every time a woman becomes the first leader in one of those professions or in one of those companies, right? It ought to just be the natural order of, of doing business because a woman happened to be the very best person for the job. So yeah. right now we're still in a place where there's a lot of national news stories about the first woman this and the first woman that. We'll be in a better place when there aren't so many female firsts and where it's just normal. Yeah, we, I mean, I think that there are more of us on the playing field, thank goodness for that, and to encourage more of us to take bigger roles, bigger steps on the playing field. And it, it's important that we do that because that's how the door opens up for the rest of us to get in, don't you think? Oh, it is. And, and, and we do have to encourage each other. And I think every woman who has, you know, gotten anywhere to any step needs to turn around and give that hand up to another woman, too. I, I, I think that couldn't be more important because I, I don't know otherwise how things are going to change. You know, people can shout from the mountaintops, but unless we've got <laughs> women giving a hand up to other women, and men giving a hand up to women, yeah. then, then things are not going to change. So yeah. that's something I, I think about a lot. Yeah, it's an important piece of the puzzle. And, and I, ha- I know that some of my biggest opportunities have come from men who have given me, who saw me being a really important piece to their business or to being a poor, important piece to their organization. And so that's there. And all of us probably have a few guys that have mentored us in our careers, especially those of us who are a little bit older. So it's important for us to hand back, hand, put your hand back, bring someone else in. These young women nowadays are quite incredible. I have one working for me. My daughter is, is part of the legacy of my business. And she thinks she's the boss most of the time. And my <laughs> audience has heard that. <laughs> and it's interesting to see because She really is an extension of who I am and all the experiences I've had as a woman in places where 
generally speaking, I shouldn't have been. And what I mean by shouldn't have been is that that opportunity shouldn't have been an opportunity for me, but I always felt like I'm just going to push forward and, and get that opportunity for myself and then bring my, bring my children along. And specifically, my daughter's been watching all these years. I can't, I, I have to chuckle. I remember one day I was down in my home office and we had it in the basement when I lived in Oregon. She came downstairs and I, I think she may have been about 13 or 14, maybe 15, maybe somewhere in there. She came downstairs and said, mom, I Googled you, you're important. And then she, she, she kind of ran out of the office and went back upstairs to the kitchen. It's like, okay, you know, but that's how they see the world. They've been so fortunate to be raised in an environment where technology has given them so much knowledge, good and bad, but generally speaking, yeah. a lot of good knowledge. Oh, I look, I totally agree. But I do think it's kind of a funny story. Sometimes it takes an outside voice, whether it's, you know, you know, her Googling you or she heard it from somebody else that, hey, you were an important person before she believes that, right? <laughs> all, all of us, all of us are like that, right? There's this uh, a little bit of dismissiveness of the people who we are closest to sometimes. But yeah, technology has been such an incredible positive. And like every other, every other um, invention, of course, it has its downsides. We've got to figure out how to control certain aspects of it. We haven't yeah. really figured out some of these things yet. Um, you know, even with, even with TikTok or, or other means of social media, you know, people are exposed to to things that they don't, they don't want to be. Um, and you can go down these sort of, you know, dark holes of, of bad kind of content and mis and disinformation. However, there is so much advantage and so much democratizing. Um, so it is so democratizing for people to be able to access so much information, almost no matter where, no matter where you live, no matter where you go, it's so important to do that. You've seen an evolution of not only storytelling, but journalism. Where do you think your mission is in all of this? I know that you took a little bit of time to talk about being at Arizona State University and you're in Washington, DC as a part of that. Yeah, as well. yeah. So, so I'm in Washington and Look, one of the things that I want to do is make sure people know more about this great public university. You know, Arizona State University is the largest public university in the country. It is the most inclusive and diverse public university in the country. And I don't think most people know that outside of outside of Arizona. And it's very and it's very important. It, you know, is an incredibly innovative. It's got amazing programs. So I'm really proud of, of being here. And one of the things that I like the most about it. And one of the reasons I decided to come here instead of going somewhere else is, it, is its charter. And what it actually, mm -hmm. this sounds like it's boring, but it isn't. But <laughs> it's, what it says in the charter is that Arizona State University prides itself not by how many people it excludes, but by whom it includes and how they succeed. Wow. Now, there, there could not be a more important message because you know a lot of universities spend all their time talking about how they turn away 92 95 98 percent of the people who apply to it and what arizona mm -hmm. state university talks about is we will open our doors to you and help you succeed and that's the kind of place that i want to be at yeah yeah i love that i love that whole concept that you know we accept we include and that's where we're headed as I think as a world, certainly as a country, some people may not understand that, but it, that's where we're headed. It's all about including people in the concept and stories, different stories. I can't say enough about <laughs> that book because when you go through that book, Women, Women National Geographic's Image Collection, you go through that book and you see a global perspective of women doing the same stuff you know, in Africa that they're doing here in Washington, D.C. and, you know, in Alaska down to Antarctica. It's just and that's what I think our world is all about. And that's why I really wanted to interview you, because having that perception that way in, in honoring and understanding when we say inclusive, you know, being inclusive, people get so narrow in that focus. 
When we say inclusive, that's a, such a range, don't you think? Oh, it is. And, you know, one of, the, one of the great things I got to do as part of creating, being part of the team that created that book, was I got to interview, you know, 25 of the most incredible women in the world. Everybody from the, you know, Prime Minister of New Zealand to Oprah Winfrey to Jane Goodall to groundbreaking other, you know, scientists. Um, and, you know, what, one of the things, though, that was a little bit sobering about it is these, all of these amazing women, to a person almost, talked about their own sense of insecurity that they had certainly as younger women, right? And mm. this sort of foster syndrome they felt once they started succeeding. And they didn't quite feel worthy. And I, I just was astounded that all of these powerhouse women thought that about themselves, of, you know, of all the people in the world, they thought that about themselves, that they weren't good enough. And yet the other, the other thing that they all said was that their advice to younger women now is just to go for it, to push past those insecurities, to know your worth and to ask for it, right? To demand, to demand your rights, to, you know, speak up for yourself. And as hard as that can be to do, um, they all had come to that conclusion. I must say that interviewing those 25 women was one of the most, um, I don't know, enriching things that I've gotten to do in, in you know, my reporting career, really. Wow. Wow. It's, it, it is quite incredible to think that, you know, you look at those women like Oprah and Jane Goodall and, and the kinds of things that they do or did to, to change the world. And then they're saying, oh, I felt a little uncomfortable about who I am, really. But we know that this is true. Yeah, we, well, we do know that, that this is true. And I think it's a good reminder, too, that, you know, people do need they do need that hand up. They do need that word of encouragement. They do need that pat on the back sometimes um, yeah. to just get to get to the next place. And everybody needs that. Even the everybody. even people like these people when they were younger. Yeah, everybody needs that. And that that's where our story began. And what fascinated me about your story about your dad, that you just that stamp of approval or that ability to encourage you to go for what you really believed in. I think I, from meeting you and seeing the work that you've done over the last years, many years in this field, all stems from that ability to know that someone has your back. Someone is supporting you to go forward. You know, even with your husband, someone has your back, but also that stirs the fire within you to keep going. Well, it does. And, you know, we all have to get nourishment from somewhere, right? And I'm not talking about the jelly beans I'm eating. Uh, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> right? But, uh, you know, we do need that, 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 not just those empty calories, we need that deeper nourishment. And yeah. um, it does come often from encouragement, both from people we love, but sometimes from people we barely know. And it is, it is so helpful. So whenever you, you know, are feeling really short with people, it's just worth, worth it to step back and go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Now people who have been listening to this interview know why you're on the badass list. Because you're oh. badass. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's funny. I, I watch body language because that's what I do for a living. This is funny because I have a picture of you. This picture says a lot about you. And I'm just gonna describe it to those who are not viewing this, this podcast. She's standing with her arms crossed looking out into the future, but there's this resolve, but it's, it's a quiet resolve. You don't bang. I'm sure that you can be the boss when you need to be the boss and that's a great thing. But there's something about you that gets people moved by who you are just by standing there, just by you standing there looking out with that resolve. And that's what inspired me about you. It really did, Susan. So I'm so thrilled that you had the opportunity to share this time with us because you bring that, that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quiet resolve that I know is a force of nature. Oh, Denise, you're way too kind, but thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me on your show. It's been an honor to talk with you. 
It really has been my pleasure too. If there was one thing that you would like to tell the women, this one thing that you would like to encourage them or tell them, what would that thing be? Um, I think the most underappreciated quality is um, one of resilience, right? Every day isn't going to be your day. Sometimes, you know, whole weeks or months or even, you know, a year might not be your year. But that ability to just keep pushing forward is, is so incredibly important to just keep pushing ahead and to put one foot in front of the other if that's what it takes because you will get to, you will get to that place. And so I do think that resilience is just an underappreciated quality and behind every success is a lot of resilience. Yes, there is. I think resilience is so important. And I'm gonna leave one last thing too, because it reminds me of how I met you. It's important for women to be in community, to support each other, to invite each other, to get together, you know, our kids' graduations, the bar mitzvahs, all the things that happen that bring women together in c- community is important because in community, you will find yourself and you'll find support you need. You know, I'm glad you said that. The other, my husband and I were actually talking about this the other day. Um, we were invited to an event and, you know, we were busy and it wasn't that convenient, but we kind of looked at each other and said, you know what, we're going to show up because showing up really matters. It actually really matters to show up. And I think you've just got to do that sometimes, even if it isn't on your schedule, showing up really matters to people. Showing up really, really, really matters. It's really important to, someone told me the other day that he, he collects strong women. So it's important for us to collect each other and to be you know, there for each other as women as we, march through to change our world. Well, thanks a lot, Susan. I know I'm going to be seeing you soon. I'm excited about that. I wish you the best of luck at Arizona State University and all the wonderful things you're doing there. And I'm going to encourage all the women listening and whoever's listening out there, get that, get that book. That book is something else. It's really quite a journey. It really, really, really is. So thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. All right, we'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Now that you have seen the interview with me and Susan Goldberg, you can understand why storytelling is so important, why resilience is the one thing that we can use that will take us through all of the ups and downs of our times, all of the ups and downs of our lives and get us to the other side of, to our fulfillment. You also see how using all the ways that you can communicate, all the medias are such an important tool. Learning to use them and learning to incorporate them can make a difference in your life. This is one of the tools and I would like to encourage you to share this podcast with your friends and your family and let's really expand the Women Express community. My commitment to you and to all the women that I work with is to provide a platform that will allow us to have a stronger voice. Also to provide a flat platform where we can see ourselves in other women like Susan. Susan has been just a great, as I said, that silent, strong voice that really is out there moving the world and making things change. And that's you and that's me. So let's share our stories, share our ideas, please share the podcast. What's coming up for us with Women Express? What you can expect within the next few months, a Women Express Summit, where we're going to come together and share our stories virtually. And then ultimately, I'm going to be doing one-on-one coaching for women's leadership under the We Women Express banner. It's going to be a year-long program where you can get coaching and experience. And I'm going to be bringing in many of some of the speakers that have sh- I've shared with you here on the podcast. So look for that too. You can go to womanexpresspodcast.com and see all of the things that we're doing and having so much fun putting together. It's going to be amazing. And then last but not least, we're in the final phases of writing the book. I don't want to give away the title of it yet. Some of you already know what it is, but I don't want to give away too much. But just know it's going to be badass. <laughs> Since we got badass out there today, 
it's going to be badass. And we're in the last phases of it. We had planned for to launch it at the beginning of the year, 2023. So thank you for listening. We're going into our third year of Women Express podcast. So thank you for being with me. Please follow, follow me, subscribe, and share. That's the most important thing. And let's build this community where our voices are valued, where our insight is important, and that we have the platforms to share our insight with impact. Thank you so much. We'll see you again in a few weeks.